Okay, welcome to the Peak Provider NDIS podcast. My name is Chris Hall, your host, and today I've got Britt Palmer with me. Now, Britt is a support coordinator at a company on the Central Coast, uh, where I'm from, called Just Cause. Um, and today we're going to really delve into the subject matter of referrals and the intake process to understand kind of where that sweet spot is in terms of what are the appropriate amounts of information for a support coordinator to provide to a provider, excuse the pun, um, and where is the line where it becomes too much and it's an administrational burden or a privacy um, you know, problem, et cetera. Um, so Britt, first of all, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have, on, have you on today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Um, so look, I mean, just for those that may, you know, may, not, may not have heard of Just Cause um, you know, yet, could you tell us about um, what you guys do as a company? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for people on the Central Coast, it's maybe a little bit, um, you know, our name makes perfect sense, but for anyone outside of the Central Coast, it doesn't. So Just Cause stands for Just Coordination of Supports. Um, and that is simply all we do. So we have no affiliations with any other providers or any other services within our organisation. Uh, we, we only provide support coordination. Um, some of us have a dual role as support coordinators and psychosocial recovery coaches. Um, what that means is that there's no conflict of interest. Participants really have full choice and control over which providers they want to work with or engage with. Um, and it just allows us to, to take away that internal pressure in some organisations where you might need to refer internally. So, yeah, that's a bit about us. I love that. Thank you. Um, I was listening to a podcast I recorded with um, Brendan Grail, who's the former CEO of my plan manager. And I recorded it a year ago because, um, yeah, I had kind of some plan management things on my mind in terms of the philosophy of things. And that was one of the very things he brought up, you know, that we should not be ethically conflicted. Um, so that's not me preaching, but I do find it very culturally and topically relevant at this time after the NDIS review. I think, um, you know, Absolutely. yeah, I think it's relevant. I think I, I like working with you guys as a provider because I just know that I know that that's the only thing you've got your focus on. Um, so yes, you know, um, it's, it's appealing to me. Um, but let's delve into it. So I know as a provider um, that there are many quick chats that we can have, right? So it's the it's the five, 10 minute conversation where you go, okay, we've got this requirement, this is the participant, the male, female, this age, they live here, they've got this going on. And it's all the kind of pre, pre-chats pre that are pre-referral. And I think they're very necessary, aren't they? Because, you know, um, support coordinators have only got so much amount of time um, before, you know, in, order, in terms of budget, et cetera. Um, but if we think about just that pre-chat, pre-referral chat, um, what kind of boxes are you as a support coordinator looking to tick before you then disclose further details? Well, I guess, um, you know, first and foremost is is reputation of that provider. We will we would have done our research on that before. We might have collaborated with our with our colleagues about have you used that provider before? What was your experience? What do their reports look like? There's all that pre-game stuff for us as well before we even make contact in the first place. Um, consent from the participant first and foremost as well to, to engage and have those conversations with the provider and share personal information. Um, if, you know, tick boxes, are they registered or not? Because if, they're, if the plan is agency managed, are we going to be able to engage that provider in the first place? Um, we, we need to know things such as availability. Uh, what's the turnaround time? You know, if we're engaging in OT and we need a functional capacity assessment, do we need that in two weeks or can we wait three months for that? Um, is the service in line with the participant's goals in their plan? What does the referral form look like? We'll often look at that. So we'll go on the website. Is it interactive? Is it easy to use? Is it accessible? Um, is it a PDF that we have to print? and then fill out and scan, you know. So if we see those things, we, we might not even go ahead with a referral in the first place. Um, there's so many things, Chris, location, travel time, mm. um, all, all the admin things, you know. So that might just be a quick flick of an email. Yes, just yes. To, just to gather those first initial things before we even go ahead with the referral um, in the first place, yeah. Love it, love it. That all makes sense. And then from an IT point of view, um, the thing that, you know, piqued my interest there was saying, oh, looking at the referral form, because that's what I tell people all the time as a coach. I'm like, make it um, easy, make it online, make it, you know, save it, save it as a draft. But as soon as you have to print out a PDF or as soon as it's not maybe disclosed uh, how that works, it should be just instantly 
I think easy, um, so important. Um, it can be a, you know, yeah, it can repel people. Um, yeah, and on the service area thing as well, another quick, um, I'll put my marketing hat on super quick. Um, let's imagine, you know, if you went to a provider's website and they say they are Sydney, you know, whatever, like <laughs> if you see that they're in Bondi or something, then you might not intuitively as a support coordinator, give them a referral for Parramatta or something. Cause it might go, oh, you guys are based in Bondi. If you don't, you know, if you don't kind of disclose enough where you service, because I think what happens is that people are missing the mark all the time on that. They go, we provide services in New South Wales wide and they don't. They're actually Western Sydney or they don't. They're actually North Shore or whatever, or they're Central Coast only. You know, I think that marketing wise, if I think about, you know, you being behind your computer looking at that, here's an idea. Would you agree that it would be useful to literally have a visual area map? in terms of, you know, actually to clarify, we may be based in Bondi, but we serve boom, boom, boom as areas. Absolutely. I think that would be very handy. And also maybe because, you know, we are coming from a funding perspective and always looking at crunching numbers. Mm. Maybe you do service an hour away, but do you have a radius of of kilometres that you charge? You might then charge extra travel time because we would need to factor that into the, the budget as well. Yes, correct, correct. You're right. There's a, another, I love that. Another level of detail. That's really insightful because um, my attitude as a business person is I'll have hubs. I often talk about the providers have, have lots of hubs in your service areas so that the people that you recruit only have to travel 20 to 30 minutes max. But that that concept is not often even thought about and people assume oh, I'll be okay, drive an hour here, there. Oh, we'll just chuck that on the schedule of supports. It's not actually always okay. So I think yeah, that visual map plus clarity about whether you even need to, to do provider travel fees, because you might not. And that also might be more attractive if you've got clarity about the hubs and the fact you don't have to travel, but so you don't have to charge extra fees. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is Very good. Attractive. I like this. This yeah. is sharpening my, <laughs> my sharpening my mind on that, those distinctions. Um, so I think that the following questions that I want to ask are, I must make clear that they're all on the presumption that consent has been given. Um, and, you know, even with consent, though, there are different sorts of stages, aren't they? There's the initial pre-chat and that that's OK. We're figuring that out. Um, I suppose in that chat as well, we need to understand, do you have staff? Are they, do they have the right experience and training for the disability that we're supporting? Um, and of course, availability. Right. So, you know, availability and suitable staff. We, we need to be able to, as providers, I think, answer that as quickly as we can um, on the phone um, because, you know, there's, please give me some insight into your world. Is it fair to say there might be, it's inevitable that you need to shop around a bit um, to figure that out, don't you? We've got someone, they're good, they're available. Yeah, and that initial, um, if we're flicking a quick email just to get those basic things to make sure that that service aligns, that might go to three, four, six different providers, you know. So um, there is a bit of shopping around, absolutely. Mm. And that only speaks to the slickness of your process, right? If it's rigid and cumbersome, it would come back to the referral form thing. Um, so, yes, you, you've got to satisfy all the checkboxes that we just talked about, but you've also got to make it easy because then, you know, speed of response, ease of response, that could be the very thing that means that, you're progressing further along in the conversation than the person that took two days to get back to you. Definitely. And if, if you don't hear back from somebody, we would never chase either, you know, so that's, a, that's another thing is that I'll then look at my inbox and go, okay, these three people have gotten back to me within that, you know, within 24 hours. And if someone hasn't, then I would not, I probably wouldn't follow them up. I'd start then looking at those providers that did get back to me in a timely manner. Yeah, exactly. So I guess I'd yeah. like to, in my mind, I'm trying to have a philosophical conversation, but also almost design the ideal business process and IT approach, because I see it as three stages, right, in terms of what could be possible. I see it as the pre-game pre chat we just talked about, and then the, I'd call it the formal referral stage, uh, where you've got to collect, you know, participants' names and maybe NDIS numbers, etc., um, and just some details. And then after that stage, there's the initial intake stage. And I'm not talking about the full intake process. And I'm talking about in that stage three, there's probably a bunch of information that the support coordinator typically does have. And it would be operationally the most efficient to, to ask for that from the coordinator um, so that we could start services sooner, right? 
Um, but I feel like we need to go through those stages and only progress to the next one once we've satisfied each stage, if that makes sense. So we do the pre-game and then for the referral process, um, you know, what are the pieces of information, I suppose, that we need to do at that stage? Because, um, of course, we need to know the participant's name. I think it's fair to say probably the date of birth, so we understand their age, um, their disabilities. Like, you know, in your view, what are those, what are the pieces of information that are necessary to kind of go to stage two in terms of a, you know, more comprehensive referral? Those things that you that you just mentioned, yes. Um, and even at that stage, it could be more or it could be less. It really just does depend on sometimes we're limited by the amount of information that we that the participant would like us to share. Sometimes they're happy for us to give it all at the first instance. Yeah, send all the documents, send all of my reports, you know, and sometimes not nothing at all, you know. So mm. no one referral and I guess with all of these questions in this whole topic matter it's never going to look the same mm. so we could say holistically like ideally this is what we would want it to look like but it depends on you know their diagnosis their disability how they want to communicate how much they want to share and all that so I just don't have a clear cut um, in an ideal world you know we could we could make it look one way but it mm. very rarely looks like that for everyone um sharing things such as an NDIS plan, for example, at mm. the point of that sort of second stage that you're referring to, um, sharing more information and more documents. We often find that providers think it's an expectation that we will send a whole copy of someone's NDIS plan. And just want to make that very clear that that mm. shouldn't be an expectation at any point, not at the beginning, not midway, not at the end. We might share a snip of the goals because you need that to formulate a support plan, but not the entire plan. Um, and I would say that the best way to capture that information is to, at the, the, in, the intake stage, is to go and do a meet and greet with the participant mm -hmm. yourself, you know, because a lot of that information can come directly from, from them and then you know how much they want to share mm -hmm. and to involve them in, in the intake process. So support coordinators, we're not the be all and end all of information sharing. We don't want to take away the independence or the opportunity for the participant to get involved in the intake process. So we quite like it when the provider says, okay, got the basic details. Is it, you know, of course you need to know things, physical disability, psychosocial, mm -hmm. so that you know, whether your company can provide that type of support, mm -hmm. but then go and try and gather the rest as much as you can from the participant, if mm. you can. You know? mm. Mm. Um, I like that distinction. I agree. Um, yes. Um, so you, I completely agree that you, you shouldn't, you don't actually have a right to see financial details or the full details of someone's plan. That's only if someone ever provides consent. And um, there are processes for that. If, the, if there becomes a reason or if the participant wants to, um, but it shouldn't be, should we say aggressively asked for because it's not appropriate? I think that's a red flag um, if that happens. Um, it, it's happens a, it happens a lot. <laughs> happens a lot. Yeah, exactly. And it is a fine line as well because if you think about the commercials, right? Because, gosh, um, <laughs> there's two sides to the story, right? You know, I suppose the, the, the other side is that if we can't validate that there's sufficient funding remaining and all that kind of stuff, and if we don't have consent to do that, it also depends on the plan manager, right? Because in theory, you could commence supports. You put on the big team, you do all the training, you'll do all the effort. And then because there wasn't visibility, the funding, all of a sudden it stops, you know, and the, the invoices aren't getting paid anymore, right? So I suppose that's the role of the dice and the risks that providers take equally. But but of course, you have to respect the rights about what the participants are too in that regard. And and I would say that the support coordinator is not doing um, the best job if it gets to the point where that funding does run out. You you do take a bit of a gamble and trusting that the support coordinator has looked at the funding in detail and knows that there's enough there, to, mm. you know, to service what what you guys are doing. Um, and yeah, that that's our job, you know, to mm. make sure that. That we're doing that we're checking that all the time yep yep and yeah. it, it just goes to show that i guess there's a mutual dependency the mutual dependency is good operators on both sides um in order for it to function um but yes um and then i suppose like on the again if i go into my it brain for a second like i i, I think on even just goals for a second 
I think that it's nice having an option, perhaps in your referral form, where you say, well, how would you like to tell us about your goals? Um, yeah, and you can either just refer to the plan and that's shared as an attachment, like here you go, attach here, screenshot or whatever. Um, or sometimes the goals, as you know, it, you may be nine months into a plan or one and a half years into a plan and the formal goals, well, they're there and they're still right, but they've also got this because this is the current thing. So sometimes I think that even if it's just a quick, you know, please do the, please, of course, meet with the participant and do your intake and your, and, and, and your full pr robust process, but still kind of copy paste. These are my thoughts on what's important right now, you know, I'm just kind of having an initial, some form of a capture in whatever the appropriate form is from the cause's point of view. I think there is value in that, but then it needs to be followed through. Yes. And the goals in the plan are not always written mm you know, accurately or in the, in, that doesn't really capture holistically what that participant is trying to achieve. So mm -hmm. if there's another way or a more, um, yeah, in detail way of being able to share those goals, then mm. it, it, a refer in the intake form would be a good place to reword and make sure it's up to date. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then and again, I know this is getting super granular, but I'll just say it quickly. Um, I also think about where the information ends up. Um, so, you know, you can have stuff on text, phones, email conversations, and it's like, oh my God, there's stuff everywhere. And it's, it's a bit, you know, chaotic and stuff. You know, whereas other ways are to kind of have digital processes where it kind of, you know, comes across and it's a nice little folder that if you submit a form on my website, it's all in one place. I've got my own filing system. And that's nice. You can, that can work well with Google Workspace and Microsoft, et cetera. The other way, which is getting more sophisticated and depends on your rostering system, your client management system, is to kind of literally take those data points. And if you're going to store that information and create support plans inside of your, your, your CMS, your client management system. So I'll use the term CMS for everyone that's listening. <laughs> and if that's where your target of information is, in my opinion, I think it's nice if you've got a little file upload button and, and I agree with you, Britt, it can be optional, right? You can say, hey, if, if, if you want to upload any functional assessments or allied health reports, click here, optional upload, not, not, not mandatory because we recognize that sometimes it's not appropriate. But the benefit of that is that it's, it's ending up where it needs to be. And I know that's not your concern, but all I'm saying is that can you see how we can align our worlds if we get our strategies right? Absolutely. And and that is, you know, your your um, IT brain and the way that you operate and your CMS and, and all the things that you do, it's a rarity, to be honest. So okay. if more providers, yeah, we don't see it very often. So um, it is often half of it's in a text, yeah, in an email, some phone information. Where is that being captured? We don't often know where that's being captured because we don't see your processes behind the scenes. Um but if we could have that confidence that it was all going to one place in mm. a secure location, yep. that, that would be great if you can encourage more people to do that. <laughs> and I am. I mean, I, I, I've recently started using a CMS called Zango um, in my own business. And, you know, I've done some webinars on it and, and, and that particular system, quite literally, if, if, whether it's yourself or the participant or the nominee, if someone says nominee name, NDIS number, date of birth, all the, all the kind of the, the fundamental stuff, that goes into what's called a lead inside of the CMS. And then you just go click a button and it says create participant. And it's like, it's magic because that, that just means the flow happens seamlessly. And then you've got this concept of a record of the participant instantly there. And then I can send, this is when we start segueing into this idea of this secondary initial intake process where I can go, cool, Brit, thanks so much. Service agreement signed. By the way, that service agreement should come from your CMS as well. So it should be like, Create service agreement, click, and it just goes, shoom, it brings them in all, all the information that we've done already. All these little refinements that save time. Um, this, uh, this is relevant because it's kind of it, how we started the conversation. You know, how easy are you to interact with it as a provider? How seamless are you? Because if I can like do this stuff and 24 hours later, literally, I've got the referral, I've had the information, I've done the meet and greet, I've done my initial intake and I've asked you for a bit of information and boom, service agreement signed. By the way, we start on Monday. Those are the breaths of fresh air that we all need, right? For your sake, our sake, and the participants' sake. It absolutely is. And, I, yeah, we're all time poor, but we all yep. care a lot. So mm -hmm. you can kind of blend those two things together, which you, your process obviously does do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's the best way. Absolutely.
Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, so uh, let me go uh, carry on and go just a tiny bit more granular. And this again is, is I'm not trying to be pedantic in asking these questions. I genuinely want anyone listening to this to go, oh yeah, I'm asking that and maybe that's not appropriate or Ooh, we should be asking for that too. Like I want people to think about the detail, right? This podcast is brought to you in proud partnership between Peak Provider and Izango Care Partners. Izango is a system that I have used personally in my own business on the Central Coast um, and do so today. It blows my mind in terms of what it can do in terms of the simplicity of the rostering process, both as an administrator and the back end at the management level, but also from a support worker point of view. Um, I'm a believer that you should not have any pieces of paper um, as an NDIS provider and that even your observational chart should be inside of a system such as Izango. And I'm happy to say it can do all of that and more. So if you're looking for something that allows you to do billing once a week at the click of a single button or indeed export to zero for payroll, it does all of that. Um, but it goes even beyond that and it starts to exceed many of the systems out there because it gives the ability to manage concepts such as sill houses. So property number one, two, and three, and which participants are in that property and what staff belong to it, et cetera. You can match the skills and, and particular support worker preferences from one participant to a team of support workers. And you can even stop people from being rostered on um, from a compliance point of view if they've not uploaded their recent CPR certificate, et cetera. Um, so all of that, is just incredibly polished and works really well. And I can testify to that from a personal experience. But what it does is it does way more than that from a customization point of view. I've never met a IT provider that is not only willing to do customizations, but able to turn them around in a timely manner um, according to your very specific requirements. So if you're interested in signing up to Izango, um, check it out um, via Peak Provider. It can do everything from capturing data to tracking leads, to creating participants based on all of that initial data um, and ongoing administration. So don't have all these data points in various places that are disorganized, have them in a central system such as Izango and you will find that your administrational time gets cut in half. Um, so inquire now via the link in the show notes below. Um, this is something that Peak Provider highly recommends and I hope that it does well for your business. So sometimes when it comes to say um, your GP details, I, I to date historically have you know, asked for that on a referral form, but I've noticed that that's a bit of a flip of the coin. Like sometimes the, the participant may not even have a GP or the, only the participant knows that details and that's too too far for the for the support coordinator. What about specifics on GPs? Do you think that's, is that a step too far in terms of expecting the coordinator to provide that detail? Well, it depends. It depends on the service provider and what service they're offering. For example, if and if it's necessary to have those details, if you're a direct service provider, you're mm -hmm. providing in-home supports or community participation supports, you might be taking them to appointments or, or mm -hmm. supporting them to book an appointment with a GP or any other medical professional. Mm -hmm. um, you might have a whole range of um you know, supports in place for medication management. They, they might take medication three, four times a day, things like that. Then it would be necessary to have those GP details. Um, another thing might be if you're a registered provider specifically, mm -hmm. all registered providers are required to have a disaster management plan um, in place. So each provider's plan might look different. There's no set template, but does that plan ask for GP details, a second emergency contact, um, which is great to have in the event of an emergency or any crisis point if you're supporting. Again, if participant doesn't want to share, they don't have to, but I, I would say that in, in the instance of direct supports and in-home supports, those details would be important. Brilliant. I was going to ask about emergency contacts and you, you, you address that perfectly. So I, I would, again, IT wise, put that in the optional section. I would say like, here's the here's the um, the core information that we, we have to know, like if we're going to do services here, like, please do let us know the legal name, the NDIS number, who's the plan manager. We have to know that, please. And then, hey, if we if you do know this stuff, fill it in if you feel like it's appropriate, you know, and, then, and just kind of put it as mandatory versus optional fields. Like that's where my, my brain sort of goes. Um, that's interesting. Um, are there any kind of, you know, even though we just agreed that GP and emergency contact could be, you know, appropriate, um, can you think about any examples of data points? And again, I know it's going to depend on the service always, right? But are there kind of things that, what other things are going too far that, that should not be provided almost ever by the support coordinator? 
I don't have a clear cut answer for that because um, it would look different depending on the participant, yes. to be honest. Yes. The only, it would always just be um, whether they're, whether they're happy to share that level of detail or not. And also if they're, you know, think about cognitive capacity as well, maybe they're like, yeah, share, share this particular thing, but we might go, oh, you know, is that the right decision? Are you making the right decision there? Is it really necessary to provide that level of detail to that person? How are they going to use that? Why do they need it? Um, yeah, I, I just don't have a clear cut okay. answer. For, some, for one thing that's absolutely not to be shared, um, can can you can you think of an example? Um, I suppose like finances is typically one around finances, yeah. but again, there might be some rare exceptions. It really does depend, right? So, um, yeah, it depends if there's guardianships involved or you know that kind of thing. Like, it really does matter. It does, it, yeah. You, you get my point. Like, it really it depends situation by situation. Yeah, finances is an interesting one um, because again, it does depend on their um yeah their cognitive capacity for decision making things like that we might need to actually protect them financially mm -hmm. and therefore it would be really important to know for the provider to know that there is a trustee in place because perhaps we know that they're being financially exploited in some mm -hmm. way and i have had many cases of, of that um whereby family members might be ringing up the trustee to get funds, you know, um, released and, and things like that. So in that point, to safeguard the participant, it would be helpful for the person supporting them on that day mm. to know that level of detail. Correct. You know. Yeah. Yeah, correct. And then even, even on the example where someone's, where a third party's managing the finances, like maybe the participant still has a debit card or whatever else. And, and unfortunately, I've also seen it too, where, you go, well, there's a history with the family members here, the son and the daughter, they borrow mum's debit card and just get whatever they'd like and they fill up the petrol with that. You know, that's not meant to happen. Please keep an eye out for that and please encourage the participant not to just, well, you know what I mean? It's a fine, fine line navigating all of this stuff. But yes, awareness in certain situations is crucial. Yes, I think that's a good way to put it is just the awareness around some of the danger zones that uh, we don't want to see participants get into and it's our job to protect them in that in that regard exactly um i yeah. suppose a um another thing that uh, every provider is is bound to you know we, we have to do a risk assessment right um and that is crucial and of course the detail needs to come from the provider what i saw with a, a very large i won't mention the name of the provider but it was one of the top 25s um, that you know I've seen and I thought, saw a really cool process where you know how we've got all these different areas where you might need support I'll, I'll list them out personal care mobility transfers domestic assistance community participation mealtime management communication um, etc um, with all of those areas in my opinion on a referral form having a very quick yes no for each one of those does the participant need support in transfers yes no mealtime management yes no that to me is a very efficient way of objectively identifying the realms of where you need to focus your risk assessment and the intake process and the sourcing of staff so i feel like that quick fire yes no thing and then if you answer yes even if it's some initial text notes where you can go yep transfers are necessary we've got this and this going on etc what do you think about that in terms of you know support coordinators providing that information i just think not at the initial referral stage so okay that would be in in your you know three phase um mm -hmm. three stage um approach would that would come later so okay. it, depends at, it depends at which point um just because again time poor you know the initial referral i think in terms of tick boxes of things would be more like yes high high or low support needs physical psychosocial things that are, are important or mm -hmm. if um or tick boxes of what service we're looking for. If it's an allied health provider that has dietitian, physio, OT, you know, which one of those things are you looking for at the initial referral stage? Mm -hmm. But I don't know that we would go through that many tick boxes until a bit later. Okay, so this stage three intakey thing. Yeah. Here's the one thing I get confronted by, by that, right, is that 
think about if someone needed mealtime management, um, then it might be that you need to have a staff member that's trained in dysphagia or has done has followed mealtime management plans before. If you don't have that initially in that, call it stage two or whatever, then I suppose the risk is that you go ahead and do a meet and greet. You think you've got the right staff member and then it's only... Do you see what I mean? Like I'm, I'm trying to, I know I'm trying to create perfection. Okay. It's a messy system, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, like the identification of staff, um, that's the kind of like, oh, but, or transfers, do you need help? Yes, no. Well, have you got manual handling training? Um, that's the thing. Would it be possible then on the intake to have, to have it be more of an optional? So if we know that those things are necessary, then you could fill out that part of the form or you could go skip page yeah you know so if it's not on there yeah then it, the assumption would be that those things are not part are not going to formulate part of the support plan rather than having to tick no 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 mm. could you just skip that section you could does that make sense yeah. it does make sense um, <laughs> the time it does make sense of time. And again, I really appreciate the robustness of the discussion because um, my my cynicism says if you make it optional like that, then it could be skipped over and you go, oh, I'll get to that later. Like, and, and, and therefore it leaves a gap where you don't focus on it because we didn't, it wasn't disclosed, if you, you see what I mean. Yeah, um, and that's the support coordinator's job to make sure that we're, you know, capturing the right information as well. So I'm just coming from a place of, you know, I know what our staff do and how we would hope that wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. We would hope that we would fill it out correctly. But I understand that I'm only speaking on behalf of of how we would operate, not necessarily yeah. every support coordinator. So therefore, in this discussion and in, you know, what you're trying to capture, you need to think about the thousands of other people yes. that you're working with as well. Correct, correct. Because 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 hypothetically, you know, the, the the theoretical advantage of a quick yes no across those say six or seven categories is that you can you can kind of like a matrix of risk sort of thing and go right. I understand the risk. I understand the staffing. Cool. I can now take that to the next detail step. Right. If if you don't do the yes no and you have it as the optionals, then you then have to kind of open up whether it be check boxes or whatever for all the things that might sit underneath that. And it becomes like a huge, it becomes a bigger form. If that makes sense, it becomes like massive because you've got to fit all of the subcategories in to tick, you know, okay. Mealtime management. Yes. No dysphagia, this, that, you know, what is, you know, what is it if we don't say quick yeses and no's and, and, and I'm not, I'm not arguing the point. I'm just expressing a, a, an architectural thought. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I get it. I get it. And um, I'll go back to saying like not many forms look like that. So okay. you're, you're speaking of something that we would love to see. We would love to have the yeah. option to be able to do all of these things. But mm -hmm. to be quite honest with you, most referral forms are a word, a one page, two page, you know, word document mm. that we're typing in. That's not interactive. That's, mm. um, so, so you're speaking of, you know, a perfect world mm -hmm. where all referral forms looked like that. I'm trying to lift the standard, Brit, lift the standard. I know, you're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, okay. So let, let, let's, let's, again, let, let's take a step back and say, all right, so we've got three stages, right? Let's, let's, re let's review them. The pre-game, we've got to have the quick fire answers. We've got to tick the boxes, do what we did. Um, then we go to referral, and I think we're agreeing that the basics that we've discussed are necessary and then i guess again let's let's give it a name are we talking about it can't be the full intake process but what what would you call it would you call it the initial intake um you know what would what what, what kind of words would you put to the type of stuff we're discussing in this stage three intake, intake. i mean yeah the, i can't think of any other words yeah. um intake would be it yes okay 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 um so again philosophically if we're at the intake stage what that means i suppose is that we've agreed to services and we've got a service agreement because we wouldn't be doing intake otherwise would we no that's right the service agreement i would hope would come mm. prior to the the very low level detail that we might then start providing after that mm. uh, to formulate the support plan true um so yeah interesting 
So all those stuff of transfers, mealtime management, you know, domestics, all that. If we, I have to ask that question at some point, right? And I do want to hear it from the support coordinator. I don't just want to hear it from the participant because they might be vulnerable or not able to express that or have thought of that, whereas you might because you've seen it before and, you know, the risks or you see where I'm going. So I'm just trying to figure out, um, is it the conversational aspect of things rather than a form or like, yeah, when, when do I ask that? That again, philosophically, when do I ask that? Because I think I want to, I think I have to insist that I want to ask your opinion as a coordinator on that. So otherwise it's too risky. Yeah. And it depends again on the participant in the situation, because True. in some cases I yeah. might be on the phone to you for uh, 45 minutes discussing that participant, because there's so many things that are very important to know. Mm. And in other cases we might not. And it might also be the level of funding that we've got. If we've got 12 hours a year to, um, you know, to work with that participant, then we might need to really cut that referral process down and just give the very necessary details because spending that time providing all of that information is not directly going to benefit the participant and therefore is not the best use of the funding. Touché. Whereas we have 100 hours allocated Yep. And there's lots of information, then maybe we can go, okay, it's going to benefit the participant if I if I really get deep down into the detail of, mm -hmm. of these things and give it to the provider. Um there's just no clear cut scenario. Okay, no, fair enough. And um my idea um that comes from this is that um technically what you can do is you can do things called pre-filled forms. So like let's say you and I we have the pre-game chat and, and it just turns into a 30-minute conversation. I'm doing a good job as a provider I, I'm making notes as I go right and so rather than burdening you administrationally what I would do is I would say I'd get it to that stage three and ideally I would pre-fill that form with the things that I know to the best of my understanding and I go hey Britt I just need um, the stuff that's left in blank on the intake form here can you please fill that in and just check that my understanding is correct and the rest because then again we're just saving you a bit of time whilst being diligent how's that sound as a compromise yeah, that sounds yeah. great. Like I said, we're kind of not the be all and end all of, of, of information gathering, but filling yeah. blank. So yeah, you know, we don't want to have to repeat the same information over and over if it can just be captured as quickly and easily as possible. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so I think that's a great idea. Cool. Okay. So, so we get that the, you know, we've got the administrative burden and the budget um, constraints. That's kind of the, the professional side of things. Also in terms of repeating things, I think it's really important for, for all providers to be aware that um, having to re-describe your disability or re-describe why you've got PTSD or whatever, that fundamentally is traumatic often for a participant. Um, so, um, you know, get you, you basically as a provider, this is not me saying anything to you, but this is me saying to all providers, please do read all the reports. You know, don't, don't hassle the participant to repeat their story because that can be traumatizing. Yes, and that's a really good point because referrals to providers will always depend on, or in lots of cases, will depend on the participant's previous experience. Mm -hmm. So what what have what have they experienced with a particular provider before? Has is is that going to trigger some sort of trauma? You know, so mm -hmm. yes, yeah. yeah, cool. Um, nominee, right? So sometimes again, we don't know until we ask. Um, so I've also seen it where people have made honest mistakes and they've asked the participant to sign a service agreement, but actually it should have been the nominee because the nominee existed and we didn't know it was the sister or the mother or the brother. Um, so in my opinion, I think that would be stage two. You know, it's the I'm taking referral information so that I can generate a, a service agreement. Would you would you agree that we kind of as providers have to know if there's a nominee in particular to sign the service agreement? Nominee, Yes. Um, guardianship, public guardian would depend on, and of course, because they they are the ones that provide consent for services in, mm -hmm. in some cases. Um, so yes, plan nominee is important to know for, for signing um, service agreements, et cetera. Mm -hmm. In terms of public guardian, it depends on what service, like what functions they provide. So if they make decisions around services, then yes, it would be important for you to know that because they're going to be making that decision whether to engage you as a provider. Sure. Um, 
But if they only make decisions around medical and dental, for example, then perhaps we don't need to provide the public guardian details because it's completely irrelevant. Or if you're a SIL provider and the public guardian makes decisions around accommodation, then obviously you would know that. So depends what function they serve, depends what service you're providing um, as to whether that detail would be relevant. Great. I love that. Nice distinction on Guardian in particular. So, so okay, so we, again, that kind of like, you know, whether it would be an optional, if there's a nominee, please fill it in here, or if there's a nominee, yes, no, and then it opens up, you know. I, I think that's fair um, regardless, right? And then, yeah, guardianship, that's probably then maybe, again, it comes to the onus of the good co good support coordinators to let you know that if that's the case. Um, in, in the old place that I was a director of, um, we saw sometimes the issue that the public guardian wouldn't sign a service agreement. Um, and sometimes we'd get like a, an email confirmation and would have to like, almost like a PDF, like a ch ch picture, like attach the email to say, well, here's, that's them agreeing in writing that this is legit. Like, have you got any insight or experience in that regard? It's, it's still the same. So public guardian will not sign a service agreement ever. <laughs> it's like, hello, <laughs> come on, people. <laughs> they won't, they won't. They still, yeah. So they're, what they do is review the service agreement and then write a consent letter mm -hmm. and send that back to you. Mm -hmm. And that's the case always, yeah. Bloody annoying. Um, think about the CMS, right? Again, IT-wise, um, I would suggest having a sophisticated CMS that can do what I just described, like attach a PDF as demonstration of the acceptance of the agreement. That would be like beautiful um, administrationally, mm. right? Rather than just sitting in your inbox and having to dig it out each time. It's like, I attach this formally to this document. Here it is. Yeah. I'm a geek. I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, cool. All right, that's good. Thank you. Um, so interesting so i mean i think we're kind of getting alignment here on this idea i suppose of a you know a three-stage process but then um fundamentally of course there's going to be stuff that goes too far and the provider has to do um themselves right um i suppose just to kind of round that off before i move on to other questions um are there any you know can you give me some examples further as we go down the track of actual the intake process where you feel like you're being hassled for too much information and they should just be getting it from the participant. Yes. <laughs> sure you we can. Feel... Let me roll up my sleeves and tell you some stories. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do feel like that. Um, again, comes back to being time poor and also the involvement with the participant. We don't want to take that away from, from them. So... Um, we can often feel like we are being called to too much, you know. Um, gathering additional information, uh, you know, I, you know what I will say is that we prefer emails. <laughs> that's okay. something that, okay. that's something that's probably important to note is that unless a phone call is scheduled, so it's you know, yes, we're going to call each other at eleven thirty, and we're going to have a fifteen minute phone call or whatnot, and that's fifteen minutes of billable time um then that's fine but ad hoc phone calls we would prefer them in an email so that we can re review it when we've got the time to do that good point good point and it, i suppose it's the um think about the psychology not just the budget of that we, we we need to be careful not to be in a reactive state and be in a responsive state because then otherwise if we're reactive and panicked and oh my god and there's dramas and all the chit chats the budget's completely blown, right? You know, we don't have time um, formally, you know, for that month. Um, so it's a problem. It's too easy to blow it's, that time, right? <laughs> it's very true. And we, you know, it's hard to find that line on the phone of being, not wanting to come across as rude, but trying mm. to explain that, okay, can we keep this to 15 minutes instead of 30 minutes? Because actually I'm going to have to bill that to the participant and it's not in their best interests for me to use their funding in right. that way but if there was something that was quite intense an emergency a crisis something like that obviously of course you need to pick up the phone mm. and give the coordinator a call or you might say um just letting you know Britt this has happened I need to let you know because 
it's important information, yep. but I'm going to summarise all of this in an email and I'll send it through to you this afternoon so that you can review it and do what you need to do. Does Good that point. make sense? It does make a lot yeah. of sense. So, like, um, yeah, I, I, I've been through things like that before where you, you could, let's say something horrendous happened or whatever and it was an incident and someone went to hospital or there was, you know, you witnessed some abuse from a family member to the participant, like all the bad things that unfortunately can happen. Um <sighs> I, I could very easily blow 45 minutes of your day by telling you about that verbally and then subsequently having to raise the incident report and document it because you need it in writing too. So it's almost like no point in that. And that's not meant to take away from the seriousness of it. The better thing is to do what you suggested, where you raise your own incident report, look into it, debrief with your staff, do all the good practice things that you're meant to be doing, uh, follow up with the necessary authorities if necessary, et cetera, um, advise a participant that they are safe and these are their options and, and take them through the stuff um, that a good good person would do um, and then give the summary, right? Then give the summary in writing. We had a meeting today and we discussed the situation. We advised the participant that they could do this, this and that. They responded that they don't want to, therefore we went to this. Boom, summary, right? That That is that kind of, again, probably, even though it's in a stressful situation, that's more appropriate because you need it in writing anyway. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Exactly. I would be saying then after that phone call, can you please send me through all of that yeah. information anyway? And mm -hmm. I'd be asking for that so that then, um, because we, we we case note as well and they're very right. thorough case notes. Sometimes it's really time efficient um, mm -hmm. to just copy over or save an email that we've got into that case note rather than typing it all up while I'm on the phone. Yes. Yes. You know, so it's much more efficient that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then, and then, me, and then actions, you know, I would reply and say, mm -hmm. okay, cool. Thanks, Chris. That's great. Thanks for summarizing all of that. These are the next things that we need to do. So do I need to then organize a stakeholder meeting? Has there been something really serious that's happened mm -hmm. um, within the scope of my role? Then what do I need to do about mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. after? Yep. Um, and that's then maybe where I'll be using a lot more of my time mm. is the follow-up after the incident. Yes. You know. Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. This is not high school. This is not about calling to chat about the drama. We need to be professional and deal with it, protect the participants and summarize and talk about the next steps. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. okay. Um, a couple of, um, yeah, final couple of questions as a you know we talked about that kind of pre-game check boxes that, well actually not in the pre-game chat the check boxes that you're looking for we we talked about the things we talked about one thing we didn't mention yet was having staff profiles on provider websites so you know sometimes i'll be i'll be cynical for a second let's say you've got a massive organization you've got i am the ceo and i am board member and i am also <laughs> board member and i am fabulous and i have all this experience and, and, I, and you know who you are i'm only i'm only playing is that as relevant? You know, that's cool. Of course, that's relevant. But what what's more relevant to a support coordinator? Do you do you want to sort of also see the staff profiles of the support workers themselves? Like, you know, tell me because I've I'm being cynical for a second. I've seen it where I've just seen the leadership team. I'm like, well, that doesn't bloody matter. They show me the actual <laughs> workers that you got. Do they look like nice <laughs> human beings? What's their experience? Like, what what's more relevant to you? Staff profiles would be fantastic and, and, and something really easy read that we can present to the participant as well. Uh -huh. Keeping in mind too that depending on someone's diagnosis, it's safe, it is a psychosocial, um, but maybe they need to see someone's face before they make a decision mm -hmm. if they want to work with them. That mm -hmm. can be really, really important. So a photo, something just as simple as a photo, a name, maybe their name is going to be a trigger of a past experience that they've had that they don't want to work with that person. So those basic details, whilst it might be nothing to some people, it might be everything to the participant to make that choice as to who they're going to choose to work with. Yes. So we don't need to know every detail. We don't need to know where they went to school or how many kids they have or, or things like that. But I think importantly, uh, lived experience and industry experience, those two things, and lived experience in what way? We often read on a staff profile lived experience, but what what but what you know what does that look like? Okay. Um, 
uh, we, we love that sort of level of detail um, in terms of what's relevant to supporting the participant, but not not personal details. So, and the profiles to be, and this depends on the the business owner, right, and how they're going to do their website, but to all look the same and to be written in the same way, yep. and not to just get a profile off a staff member that they've written themselves and then plaster it on the website. I think it's the provider's responsibility to edit and present that in a very, you know, streamlined way on your website. So it's easy for us. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Um, That's great. I completely agree. Um, I've had a lot of genius wave idea. In your CMS, you've got your staff profiles because that's what you do to allocate them to a roster and you can have a picture of the profile and all that kind of stuff. Um, WordPress, this is going super geeky, but WordPress is one of the um, the most common website building platforms in the world. Imagine if you could um, automatically have a, a kind of like, not an export function, but like a, we're going to display the people that are the current staff as per the CMS, because that literally says who are your current staff. And you can have, and you should have all of your hobbies and your interests and your experience and your training and all the stuff anyway, in terms of profile matching with the right participants. Um, and also, Brit, um, I know that in Izango, for example, you can manage someone's um, availability. And so, for example, I can mark that every Monday and a Tuesday, this work is not available because they do this, right? So imagine if you could just automatically take that and it's displayed on the website and it tells you in real time that this person's available on a Thursday and a Friday because, because those are the days they don't have shifts. Make sense? Oh, would love that. And that really just triggered um <laughs> thought of of what we do, what I do struggle with sometimes is that you're putting out, you're looking for one particular support worker that's available on a Wednesday and a Thursday from 12 to 5 or whatnot. And you might have to look at 20 different support workers before you find that person mm-hmm. that is available on those days and at those times. Mm-hmm. So love that. That would be great. <laughs> and literally, if it's already a provider that you know and trust the reputation of, for example, then quite literally, you know, if, if you start to be able to, you know, through experience, rely on that data accuracy because they're a you know, really good operator, um, then you, in theory, you could probably show that to the participant and go, look, again, if the data quality is good enough, this person has training in PTSD dysphagia and manual handling and blah, 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 and they're available on Fridays. Like if that can literally be there, in theory, you could send mm-hmm. a link to the participant and go, do you like the look of this person? Yeah, because yes. Because if, if you do, I'll have a chat with Chris, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. That would be perfect. That would be great. Yeah. I knew that That's was- what you're going to do now, aren't you, Chris? That's what you're going That's to go exactly away and- what I'm going to do, Brett. You yeah. know it. <laughs> yeah 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 this is i hope that this information you know can be widely shared and it's something that's not often talked about you know that Mm. how much more efficient these processes could be for every party involved yep Um, and at 2024 you know it's the the amount of times like i said that we do get that old clunky referral and Mm. we are spending so much time um, it could just be done so much more efficiently. Correct. I mean, and again, as a quick shout out to Azanga very briefly, like you upload all your compliance documents as a staff member in the app and say working with children check, that's a mandatory document. And if you're working with a child under the 18, it literally will stop you from rostering the staff member that didn't have the working with children check. Wow. That's amazing. That's fantastic. But that's that's necessary. And then also like if you have, say, you have less complex clients, mediums, more complex. And then when you've got complex, let's say you need to have these particular experience things. I feel like, you know, there's there's functions you can put in place to also stop that person. So being accidentally rostered, you know, when they shouldn't be, right? Because they might not have the right appropriate training. So again, that to me, it's best practice from the rostering and the um, scheduling things. But theoretically, you get all that right. It, It feeds back to that core idea we just talked about that those should be listed as skill sets on the profile's website page. Yeah. Yeah. Consistently, as you say, these are my, these are my complex care specialities, bang, 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 bang. And they're always displayed in the same way. Yes. And um, 
I'll say it again, it's rare. It's just so rare to have that visibility over the support workers. Yeah. And often we're just trusting that the provider does have all of those checks in place for mm -hmm. for their workers. Um and it's a tr it, it can sometimes be a trust thing. It, it's a bit easier with an independent support worker because we can directly say, okay, I need you to send me this, 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 this before I can mm -hmm. engage you. Mm -hmm. um, but with providers, we, we do need to have that trust that they've done all of those checks and balances before they actually send someone out to support our participant. True, true. I, I hear you. Yeah, exactly. Um, of course, registered ones can have the, the audit process, but you know, there still needs to be trust because the audit might only be every two years or, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you've got to pick it out. Um, okay, let me ask you one final question. Out, we've talked a lot about data and referral points and information that's appropriate or not in, appropriate, et cetera. Are there any additional ways in which providers can make support coordinators' lives easier? There's lots and lots of ways, but I don't want to sound, you know, it, it's it's hard because um, I think I mentioned it before about the emails, definitely. Mm. the um, In terms of updates of supports, I had an example recently that I was going to share just because it, it's been very handy for me, is that um, I have a provider that, a, a behaviour support uh, clinician, who on a Friday... 3 p.m. I know that I'm going to get a email that's a clinical note from that week and it's really short it's a little snapshot right so it's just um, this is the week this is what we've done this week and it probably takes her 15 minutes 10 minutes to write it up and send it to me but I know that if my phone rings and I see her name come up on my phone that there something serious you know it must be something she really needs to speak to me about otherwise I know Friday three o'clock I'm going to get that update and I'm going to know that everything's running smoothly and that that doesn't necessarily need to be every provider needs to do something like that because we might not need an update weekly we might need an update once every month for example because things are just going well but it's more of a yeah just knowing what that if that person's making a phone call that it's going to be something important um otherwise if it if we get call after call after call we, we'll probably just stop answering mm -hmm. to be honest um so those sorts of things make our life a bit easier um what else service agreements is is one thing i think we chase them we have to chase them quite a lot and i don't think that we should have to mm -hmm. i think that would make our life a lot easier if the expectation was just there that once we've engaged you, we expect a service agreement, we expect it to be filled out accurately mm -hmm. with, um, you know, hourly rate, is that in line with the NDIS price guide? Is mm -hmm. Have you got ideally a schedule of supports? We never get a schedule of supports. We get them from you. Thank you. You do get them from me. I'm, I'm very pedantic in that regard. Yes, that's shocking. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, th things like that where it's we just don't want to chase, we don't want to have to chase things. I think there should be some very, very basic standard expectations. Sometimes we get asked to fill out a service agreement, you know, like how, how should I do my service agreement? Can you fill it out? Um, how do I bill? You know, things that I don't know, I feel like they should be looking into that information themselves and it's not our job to mm -hmm. educate if you don't know those basic things, yes. then should you really be providing right. that? And I, I agree. I agree. Let me ask you one genuine question that I've always done, and I want to hear if this is, you know, this is good or not. Um, I like to sometimes make a distinction between, hey, how would you like me to bill it? You know, because I know that, for example, if I'm taking someone out to the community or going to the house, it does it does depend, right? Some plans are very broad and course super flexible, and it doesn't matter if you bill from personal care activities versus uh, community access right but some plans are very like no you must bill under community participation so like is it cool to just do a quick check before we draw up the schedule to say hey Britt would you like me to build this under just this or split it in half like how would you like me to build that part yeah I think that's totally fair I think yeah. that it's a good thing to check um where you know 
which part of the plan should we build from, but the knowledge should be there prior as to maybe yes. where you can build from. So yes. we can build from here or here, Britt. Mm -hmm. Which one would you like us to build from? Not um, can you please teach me how to build? Do you know what I mean? Like I we, we, yeah, I, I think that that onus should fall on that person to kind of educate themselves around the the funding and the process of billing yes. and then just double check with us and we we review the service agreement of course we will have a look over it and say yep happy for you to send that to the participant to sign mm. um but then that should be then the provider go to the participant to get it signed in some cases you know maybe they don't like having participant might not like having new people in their home and we might be going for a visit so we might take your service agreement with us because that's just easy and simple to get it signed mm -hmm. because they can't do it electronically, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, until I, I just I just feel like sometimes people expect us to do a lot of things outside the scope of what our role is rather than taking on that responsibility Correct. themselves. Um, of course, if you've tried a million times to get something signed and they, you know, it's not getting signed. Go to the support coordinator and say, "Hey, can you can you help me? I can't hmm. can't get this signed." Yes, um, totally agree. And I, 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 that to me comes down to just good business practice and decency. Mm -hmm. um, but but mm -hmm. yes, I've seen it where people try to absolve themselves of of taking the care because really under the practice standards, I believe that you are also um, obliged to verbally explain a service agreement, especially when there might be an intellectual disability or some kind of cognitive decline, et cetera, it's crucial. You can't expect someone to read the 15 page document. You've got to, you've got to actually take them through it, right? You know, as well as giving them the, the formal written agreement. Um, so, exactly. you know, care, care enough to go around. It's your job. You can't just, <laughs> you know, the thing is generationally, I'm guilty of this myself, um, but we've, we've become so transactional and digitally, digitally transactional. So we've got, I'll just send it this, I'll flick you the link. You know, and, it's, it's, and I've been there, I've done that, but like, but, but I have to kind of draw myself back and go, no, no, it's actually really important that I go and and and, and sit with them and talk them through this. Um, that's also the beginning of trust and relationship. Yeah, yeah. And electronically, sometimes they, they really don't, they don't know what they're signing. And like you said, it is our responsibility to talk them through and then, then check understanding as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. you know. This is what this means. Does does that make sense? Do you do you get that? Do you need me to go into that in more detail? Um, to just not get a signature at the bottom of a page, but to check that there's the understanding of what that person is signing. Correct. And you know, you said that Friday afternoon, three p.m. It's kind of that reassurance that everything's taken care of. I I feel like a little nuance is that once the providers got the signed service agreement why not just copy in the support coordinator when they email that service agreement to the plan manager? Because then just everyone knows it's done. That's oh, cool. All right, we're in gear. Oh, yeah, definitely. Just a, we don't mind being CC'd in, in everything really. And then we can make that decision whether that's an email that we really need to read in detail and respond to, or that's a great, thank you for the service agreement. It goes in the folder. We've got it. You know, it's great. And we don't have to chase it. So exactly. Exactly. Cool. Copy of the agreement would be great. Another thing um, I just thought about in terms of the question of making our lives a little bit easier as support coordinators would be the method of communicating with our participants um, and during the referral process, but not just during that process and the intake process, I should say, but throughout the whole time that you're engaged is we're often cleaning up mess of mm. poor communication from people that might not know how to best communicate with people with disability. There's there's that many times during the week where someone's in some sort of distress because, oh, this provider has said this or, you know, they worded it in this particular way. So um, I don't really know how to kind of pinpoint what I'm trying to say here, but I guess for staff to be trained in how to communicate, keeping professional boundaries. Once you cross that line, there's no going back from it. Yep. Um, so providing really intense training for how to maintain professional boundaries as a support worker with um, being in people's people's homes, yep. like collaborating on language. How do we best communicate with this person? How do they want to be spoken to? 
Because again, a, a throwaway comment from a support worker can derail everything. Yes. Um, and a lot of our time is spent sometimes just cleaning cleaning up the mess, you know. Totally agree. I think the, the language point on that is is crucial. And I also think that <laughs> the managerial team of providers can't assume that support workers always understand privacy. Um, and so uh, that's not meant to be patronizing, but, but uh, you know, basically things like don't bloody talk about another per another participant to the other participant. Don't mention names, don't mention details, you know, don't talk about whether you got wasted on the weekend. Like, you know, like if you had a drink, like don't do any of that. Like, just, yeah, it's crucial. Yeah. Yeah. And it, with being relaxed and being yourself is very important and that yeah. being transparent with the participant. But as you said, just really always checking the language and what you're sharing and, if you had say two support workers and they were speaking to each other about their weekend rather than engaging the participant in conversation, yeah. really yes. strong training on staff around, around those areas. Yeah. Correct. Correct. It's not, it's not, again, it's not high school is the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Brett, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so, so much. I hope for those listening that you've, got something out of it if you are on the central coast or you've got participants up this way i i would wholeheartedly recommend that the just cost just cause team i'll put a link um to their business in the show notes below but um yeah thank you very much for your time today i thoroughly enjoyed this conversation thank you chris i've enjoyed your hair flicking i haven't seen your hair um out like that um <laughs> that long for a while so i've enjoyed that and enjoyed speaking to you um we definitely have capacity for refer new referrals so they can come thick and fast if, Sounds great. if you want to. Sounds good. I couldn't recommend it more. Brilliant. Well, Britt Palmer from Just Cost, thank you again. And uh, everyone, my name, my name is Chris Hall from Peak Provider. If you're interested in scaling your business in any of the kind of things that we talked about today, whether it be sales, market, or anything else, go to peakprovider.com.au and we'd be happy to have a chat with you. Thanks again, Britt. You have a great day. Thanks, Chris. You too. Once again, for a final reminder, this podcast was brought to you by Izango Care Partners in partnership with Peak Provider. Highly recommend checking out a demo. Click the show notes below and book yourself in to have a look at what the system can do.